Uh, so there are a number of different technologies that can be used to capture carbon dioxide. Uh, one of them is called post-combustion capture, and the best way to think of that is you'd have a power plant, just like a power plant today, and you'd put in a unit right next to it that would then uh, scrub out all the carbon dioxide that was coming out of the flue gas of the power plant. Uh, the technology to do that is well developed. You can use what are called amines. Uh, basically, the CO2 dissolves into that solution. Uh, you then take that solution to another tank, uh, so to speak, and you inject some steam. You heat up the, the, that solvent, and the CO2 is released. So that's post-combustion capture. Uh, the next technology is something called IGCC, or Integrated Gasification Combined Cycle. There you use a different strategy. You take your fossil fuel resource, it could be coal, it could be, it could be gas, and you do what's called gasify that. You partially uh, oxidize uh, or combust the, the fuel, and then you make a mixture of hydrogen and uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And at that point, you can separate off the carbon dioxide, or you could do another step and, and convert the carbon monoxide to uh, hydrogen and water, uh, in which case you end uh, hydrogen, water, and CO2, in which case you basically have a pure stream of hydrogen and CO2, and the hydrogen then can be used in a power plant and the CO2 can be captured. So that's called IGCC. And then the third one is that uh, normally when we burn fossil fuels, we burn it in air. So air is about 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. So after, the, after you burn it, you've got this mixture of carbon dioxide and nitrogen. And it's typically, for gas plant, about 5%. Um, CO2 for a coal plant, anywhere between 12 and 15%. So now that you have this sort of big problem of having to uh, separate the two. If you burn the fossil fuel in oxygen, um, you don't have any nitrogen to separate out. So, so basically, you by separating oxygen from air first, you basically do your separations there. So then after you've combusted, you you're basically have a mixture of water and CO2 and then some other uh, minor constituents to deal with. So those are the three. So post-combustion, IGCC, or sometimes called pre-combustion, and oxy-combustion. So in terms of those technologies, which is the best to apply there, it's really a horse race. Um, Post-combustion, probably biggest benefit, could be used for retrofits. IGCC is in principle, it can be somewhat more efficient. Uh, for a while, everyone sure that was going to be the winner, um, but, uh, but the post-combustion folks said, well, hey, wait a minute, if we do better heat integration, we can be as efficient as you are. Um, and then uh, oxycombustion is really appealing to the utility companies because they no longer have to run a complex chemical plant on the downstream end of their power plant. So they, um, so they basically would buy oxygen. You know, they're companies who produce oxygen on a huge scale. So it makes their job easier as they get out of the, they get out of the separations business. So th that's what's uh, available today. Um, want a huge amount of research at the industrial level, at the academic level. The government's putting a lot of money into this with the big goal of reducing the cost and second goal to reduce the energy requirements. Early on when people envision carbon dioxide capture and storage, they really imagined that you would, you know, essentially capture, you know, the vast majority, uh, meaning 90 to 95 percent of the carbon dioxide um, from the from the power plant. As time went on, there was a curiosity about whether it may be more economically optimal to capture, say, 50 percent, um, that it would be more cost effective, or or 80 percent. Um, and in particular, you know, the people raise the question, well, wouldn't it be great if we had a really cheap technology to capture 50% of the CO2 from coal plants in China, you know, do that as a retrofit, since they've got such a huge new coal fleet there. Um, however, when people look at the economics of doing this, it's not clear that the benefits are that great. That, um, so, so right now, I would say that if anything, that the sort of whereas the pendulum was sort of over in that partial capture for a while, I think it swung back, and people really don't see see the overall benefits of, of partial capture. But that can change at any time. This is a very dynamic, uh, fluid, fluid environment.
if we have a mixture of, of gas, say 12% uh, carbon dioxide, the rest nitrogen coming out, and we want to separate that carbon dioxide to, say, a pur purity of oh, 95% or so, that the minimum work to do that is in the range of 3 to 4% of the energy that was initially present in, in that fossil fuel. So it's actually quite small. Today's capture processes, depending upon whether it's post-combustion or IGCC, range anywhere from 15% to 30%. So you can see that there's an enormous amount of room to go from the energy requirements for today's technologies down to uh, something much closer than the thermodynamic limit. However, 3 to 4 percent is the thermodynamic limit. Real processes are not, uh, it can never be, you know, 100 percent efficient. So if we were to be able to achieve a 10 percent uh, energy penalty or, or energy requirement, uh, that would be a really great target to shoot for. And, and again, there, there is a, a long way to go. So if we look at the amount of energy required to capture and store CO2, so the majority is associated with the capture process itself, in particular the step where we regenerate uh, the, the, the solvent as an example, or we basically separate the CO2 from this liquid we've used to capture it. Um, the, the next largest uh, energy requirement is compression. And if you look at sort of the ratio of energy for uh, capture compared to energy for compression, it's about three to one.